bad thing to say we don't know. So, all right, well, let's take a look at, at Joshua chapter 23. Yes, we have skipped all the rest of the book of Joshua. Next Sunday morning, as we look at our 79th anniversary and as we look at homecoming, we're actually going to go back and pick up Joshua 22. I think there is a message there that strongly relates to where we are as a church going forward into the future while also looking back at the past. But for tonight, Joshua chapter 23. Now this is Joshua's farewell speech. We're very familiar with the part of it that comes in chapter 24 where Joshua runs them through the history and says, now choose you this day whom you will serve. You know, and makes that declaration, as for me and my house, we will serve Yahweh, we will serve the Lord. But let's go back up to chapter 23 because we missed, the, we missed some of this. Start with verse 14. Now behold, today I am going the way of all the earth. Means he's getting old and getting ready to pass away. That's what happens to us barring the return of Christ for all of us before it happens, every last one of us will go the way of all the earth. What happens? You know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one word of all the good words which the Lord your God spoke concerning you has failed. All have been fulfilled for you. Not one of them has failed. It shall come about that just as all the good words which the Lord your God spoke to you have come upon you, so the Lord will bring upon you all the threats, or bad words if you would like to put it that way, which is the way it is put, until he has destroyed you from off this good land which the Lord your God has given you. When you transgress the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, then the anger of the Lord will burn against you, and you will perish quickly from off the good land which he has given you. The points that matter are this. Number one, God gave them a good land. It was a fertile land. It was a place that they could thrive. It was a place that all the things that they needed would be provided for. They didn't even have to build houses. They were taking over while they did have to build in some of the towns they destroyed. They were taking over where farms were already there. And if you have never tried to take unfit land and make it fit for crop farming, you may not realize just how much work you're talking about here. But just go in your backyard if you've never had a garden and go try to make it into a garden and make it a self-sustaining garden where you are growing enough food to supply your family. I have a book you can borrow about that. It's called Self-Sufficiency on a Quarter of an Acre. And in it is directions for how to take a quarter of an acre of land and, in theory, grow all the fruits, vegetables, and raise chickens. All the things that you would need except for cows. And if any one of you would like to try it and get back to me on whether or not it works, you can borrow my book. Because I don't think I'm going to be... You know, there's, there's a lot of work involved of flattening land and, and leveling everything out. There's a lot of work to be done. The people of Israel didn't have to do it, even if they had to rebuild houses. They didn't have to do all the land work. They didn't have to do all the terraforming. So it was already done. And God put them in this good land. He had given them victory. They had the opportunity to thrive as they followed him. The problem came in the fact that as adversity peeled away and they were settled in the land and they were beginning to deal with the everyday nature of life and life was fairly easy, they got sloppy in their obedience. They got sloppy in their walking with God. They got sloppy in their remembering the covenant that they had with the Lord their God. They got sloppy in remembering what His promises were what he had said he would do, both in blessing and in punishment. What he had said he would do for them to keep their hearts drawn towards him. They forgot. Maybe not really forgot. We would say, oh, well, they probably remembered, but they didn't act on it, which is unfortunately too often like us. We remember, but we don't act on it. We might as well forget. Because if we don't act on what we know, then what good is it to know it? I could have driven my way from Judsonia back to here or from here to Judsonia to, to Ann's parents' house. I could have done it blindfolded. Well, maybe not because there's other cars on the way, but in, in the way. But I know those roads.
But if I'd have got, done something goofy and gotten off on I-40 West and driven myself to Conway and then called and said, how do I get to Searcy again? Well, you know how to get there. Yeah, I just decided to do something different instead. Would have been foolish. And yet, so often, that's what we end up doing, just like the people of Israel ended up doing. Well, how does it that we do this? How do we thrive? How do we prosper? How do we, how do, we do this? Well, you walk in obedience to God first. You trust in God first. You put Him first. And then you let everything else come from there. How do we fix the divisions in our, in our church? How do we fix the divisions in our families? How do we fix the arguments that we have with one another about stuff that ultimately doesn't matter? Well, first, we back off and realize that a lot of it doesn't matter near as much as we think it does. Because the first decision is that we're going to serve the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength. And if that becomes the first thing that drives us, and then the next thing is that we will love our neighbor as ourselves, then suddenly, stop and wash your argument through that question. Notice the question is not, is my neighbor loving me as my neighbor is supposed to? The question is, am I loving my neighbor? We always want to put it on somebody else's actions. And see, the people of Israel wanted to put it got to a point that they put it on somebody else's actions. They blamed the priest for it. They blamed the judges for it. They blamed their neighbors for it. They blamed the people who they were supposed to have driven off the land, but instead they decided to settle with. They blamed everybody else for it because as they lived at ease, they got sloppy. And I could go into my into my study, and I could have brought in here, and I thought about it, but then I realized I'd have to carry them all back, and it's all... You know, there's steps. I've got a lot of history books because I love history books. I read things like that for fun. That's what I like to do. Almost more than I like to read novels. That's just what I enjoy. And you know what I find? Whether you read the history of nations or the history of churches, Always, when it's easy, we get distracted. Always, when it's easy, you look at the history of the United States. When things were smooth, we fall apart and go chasing after all sorts of crazy and bizarre things. We chase after our own pleasures and our own comforts. We satisfy our own materialistic drives and desires. You look at the history of the church, 2,000 years of church history. For over 250 years of it, at the very beginning, the church focused on Jesus is risen, and we will follow him. Why? Because those who would confess that Christ is Lord ran into a whole lot of trouble with the Roman government, up to and including death. And then suddenly it became those who confessed that Jesus is Lord had an advantage in the political sphere. And all of a sudden the church starts fighting over all sorts of things. You take a look around the church in America and things have been nice and smooth and easy for oh so many years. And yet what's happened is our hearts have drifted because we've got space to think about all sorts of other things and our churches have drifted because unease or easiness makes for sloppiness. It's difficulty that causes us to focus because when we live a life that allows us to say, well, we don't have to have Jesus for everything, then we start to push him out of all sorts of stuff. And that's a dangerous place for us to be because we start crowding him out and then we find ourselves suddenly making decisions based on everything but what has the Lord our God said we ought to do. This is where Joshua warned the Israelites that they were headed to if they weren't careful. And if you've ever read the Old Testament, you know that the book of Judges is coming. And you know what happens. For roughly 400 years while their society falls apart 
to the point that a Levite who was supposed to have been teaching God's word to the people and being an example instead casts his concubine, and we won't dwell too much on that, out to a crowd of crazed men out to satisfy their lusts and allows her to die. Because the country has become so debased that that's where their spiritual leadership has come. Because everything got easy and then they got sloppy and then things got harder and they didn't turn the right direction. They turned to wherever it was most convenient. So for us, what are we going to do? First of all, we need to realize that the easiness that we've had it, there was a time driving through Jacksonville today, I was reminded of when I went to church there when I was in high school. And, and there was a time, and it was even then, that it was, well, this church or that church has the better programs, and it was almost more a competition between churches. Which church do you want to go to? Where churches were out to get the, these people and those people. Oh, we want this guy from over here. We want that girl from over there. Why did I end up going to that church? Well, to be honest, that's where my girlfriend went. And so I ended up at that church. Then I ended up with a different girlfriend, and I started going back to the other church. What can I say? I was 16. I had a car. Mom and Dad wanted me in church. They preferred I be in a Baptist church, so I found Baptist girls. That's what I did. It wasn't always smart. In fact, usually it wasn't. That's what I did. There was a time that that's what we did as we competed among churches. Well, come over here. We have a fancy new sign. Come check us out. We've got, you know, we've got electric drums instead of normal drums. I was in a church this afternoon. They had a piano and an organ. Some of y'all are going, ooh, piano, organ. I was kind of thinking when we were having a little bit of issue about the song, about the, uh, you know, which words to, to sing. I was thinking, you know, um, in case this thing goes down in the water, there is a thing in the seat back behind, in front of you that you can pull out that has the words to all the songs in it. It's called a hymnal. Some churches are, well, we've got hymnals. Well, we've got screens. And we got in this competition with each other. Because we were at a time of ease. But while we did that, the church-going population in this country stayed stagnant and then started to slide down a little bit while the actual population jumped by tens of millions of people. And so while the number of churchgoers in this country has grown a little bit in the last 10 years, the percentage of Americans that goes to church has shrunk like crazy. Because we thought it was about coming here or going to East Union. When really and truly it's about a culture full of people that don't have any interest in going either place. Because they don't want to go there for whatever reason. They don't want to come here Maybe because somebody said something rude to them one time or because they were this or they were that or maybe they just never even thought about it. You realize even for a number of Arkansans, they don't even think about it on Sunday morning that they ought to go to church. Some of them just get up and go to work because that's what they need to do. Some of them get up, look at the clock, be grateful that they don't have to go anyplace today because they have the day off. They don't even think about it. The time that it's easy for us to just go to folks and that we find tens of thousands of people out there that are looking for a church to go to because they know they want to go to church is gone. So is the time of competing with other churches and calling that good enough. It's one reason that we did away with having an outreach team and a publicity and a you know, public relations team not about publicity. It's about reaching out. And reach out, and outreach isn't about going over and we're going to find a way to pluck people off of Missionary Baptist Church or get the Assembly of God folk down here or get the Methodists straightened out and get them to come to a Baptist church. It's about going out to wherever we can find people and saying, Jesus loves you, we love you, we want you here. Because that's our goal, is that we'll walk with Jesus and we'll take as many people with us as we possibly can. But it's going to be harder and harder to do that because it's not going to be automatically easy for folks to want to come to church. 
It's not going to automatically be something that people say, ooh, that's great. There'll come a time that when you click on your legislator's website, it's not, he's not going to trumpet that what religion he is. In fact, they'll probably suppress it. Ooh, don't tell people you go to church, you won't get elected. You say, oh, we'll never get there. Really? Think about some things that we said 10 years ago, we'd never elect a president or never elect a legislator this or a legislator that. And yet we've elected Congress people in this country that were sworn in by putting their hand on the Quran instead of on the Bible. And I bet most of y'all would have said 20 years ago we'd never do that anywhere in this nation, and yet we have. It's not going to be easy. So we have to make a decision. It's the same decision the Israelites had to make when easiness kind of faded away, when they had those years of drought, when they had those years of problems. And frequently they turned the wrong way. They turned to false gods. They turned to the Baals and the Ashtoreths. They chased after physical pleasure and tried to masquerade it as worship. I won't go any more details than that because I don't want your parents mad at me because you had to explain with any, more, any more than that. They chased after physical pleasures and ma masqueraded it as worship. They chased after power and masqueraded it as worship because they were chasing after those kinds of idols. We as a church, not just this church, but the church at large in the United States of America are going to have to make a decision whether we're going to chase after the Lord our God or chase after idols. We could try to be as flashy and impressive and amazing as anything you'd have found on TV if you'd have stayed home tonight. We could try that. I am convinced that we have more musical talent in this church than you will get in the next season of American Idol. We've got it. Some of y'all have got it, and you don't even want to admit it. You just want to hide on the back row. Or possibly in the balcony. I don't know. Let's see, who's up there? Oh. <laughs> I like the little cut sign I'm getting from over here. I'm convinced that we've got the, enough creative talent to do all sorts of things. But at the end of the evaluation of our lives, it's not going to be about whether we were more musically amazing than American Idol because that costs a whole lot of effort and a whole lot of energy and that builds a production. And what we need to build is a relationship with the Lord our God and relationships with each other. I'm convinced that we've got enough wisdom and intelligence in this church that y'all actually really probably don't need me. Y'all could take turns preaching. Some of you, some of you probably shouldn't, but some of you could. And we could have the smartest church around. We could take all, everybody in here that's in school and teach them everything they need to know throughout the week. And maybe there's some things that we should do about that. But more than that, we as a church have got to realize that what we are is a group of people walking with Jesus, and that's where we start. Not by going to people and saying, hey, come to our church, the music is this. Come to our church, the preacher is that. Come to our church, the preacher is the best looking preacher in town. I'm, that's actually almost true. I'm, I'm fairly sure, but it's, it's kind of a low bar. Um, but I've met all of them. They're all nice guys. But nobody's picking a church in this town on who's got a good looking preacher, okay? I'll just put it that way. You know, we're, we're all nice guys, but that's, you know, that's not what you pick a church for. Nobody should be going to folks, well, our church has more comfortable chairs than the other church. Well, our church has this or has that. Our church is walking with Jesus, and we want to invite you to come walk with him with us. And you know what? If you start to do that and you realize you'd rather walk with Jesus with that other group of folks, we're okay with that. As long as you're walking with Jesus. But we want to encourage you to come and do that with us here, because that's what we have. Because eventually the technology will fail us and we can put together this awesome spectacle, but something will break. And I guarantee you, and Gary will agree with me from up there and Jim will agree with me from down here, all this technological stuff we do, screens and sound systems and, you know, drums that you can actually turn down, it's an amazing thing. My band director would have loved that. Back in the dark ages when you actually, you know, beat on stuff and it just made noise really, really thin wires, and it doesn't take but one of them going out, and this whole thing goes kaput. Cool new sign. It's going to be awesome when it, the electric company finally gets it wired up. 
one little wire on that antenna that's pointed back up at this building to pick up the pick up the internet, and it's useless. A squirrel could knock all this stuff out in a heartbeat. What have we got? Not that we shouldn't use it while we've got it, because we should, but that can't be what we're trying to draw people to. Trying to encourage people to walk with Jesus with us. That's got to be where we turn to. Not to any of the idols that our culture puts in front of us and says, do this. If your church would just do this instead. If you would just compromise a little bit. This is what we want. Just compromise with this. i give you a list of preachers that have compromised a little bit here and a little bit there. And then when they finally compromised all the way, the world said, well, it took you long enough. Now sit down and shut up over there. You should have done, that a long, done this a long time ago. We can't do that. We've got to go forward. Walking in obedience and doing what God has given us to do. Why? Because the Lord has been good to fulfill all the good words He's given us. Far be it from us to betray Him and turn a good land into a grave because He's given us this good land. Fertile soil. Y'all have heard me tell this joke before and I will remind you of it tonight about the two guys that were sent to Africa as shoe salesmen. They both run into this tribe. One of them telegraphs home, get me a plane ticket out of here. Nobody here wears shoes. The other one sends back and says, send help. Nobody here wears shoes. We live surrounded by people who don't know Jesus and they don't have any use, they think, for a relationship with God. We can do one of two things. We can lock the doors and say, oh well, so much for them. They don't have any interest in spiritual things. Or we can open the doors and get out there among them and say, this is awesome. These people have no idea what it is to walk with Christ. Let's go show them and tell them and bring them along with us as best we can. There are times that it feels very, very bleak. And I won't lie to you, it is. But the people of Israel coming off of Joshua are rebuilding a nation on the top of ruins, but they're building it where God's placed them. As we go out, let's build on top of right where God has placed us and help, help others to walk with Him as we get to. Because that is a great blessing. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You for this day. Thank You for the opportunity to be here. We pray, Lord God, that You'll help us as we strive to serve You. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you all for being here tonight. Drive safely going home. And we will see you on Wednesday.